good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Welcome back to a DIOC in action. This is your boy, Mr. Leon Hunt, better known as Mr. Ross Books. One time for the one time, Keon Cool, Keon Quench. We live, of course, in a building with another one hour radio show program that focuses on the Virgin Island Olympic sports and, of course, the Olympic movement. Um, of course, as we all know, like any other show, we have topics that talks about health, coaching, athletes, updates, and, of course, the Olympic movement. So as we all know, next year is 2020, actually in a couple of weeks. So in a couple of weeks, it'll be 2020, but a couple of weeks or at least a couple of months from that, it would be the Olympics over there in Japan. That's what we're talking. Japan 2020 is the big show, and everything that we're talking about on this show is leading up to Japan 2020. So who would be there broadcasting all the live news to you guys? Myself and of course my other host over there. That's in Saint Croix, Mrs. Um, Sydney. Sydney, of course, gonna make sure I have all the ins and outs and everything. You know, me and Sydney to walk together. Matter of fact, we gotta get Sydney back on the show because Sydney likes to give us the ins and outs and the all the boats about what's going on. You check, and um, so we're gonna have her on there. We're gonna walk together. We're gonna make sure everything cool. But we all know, 2020 is the big show, and that's what we're working on. And our athletes right now, like literally. Our athletes right now are preparing for quote unquote 2020, and that's how it is. But look, before we go into 2020, this is still 2019, and today we got a special show, just like any other show. No, this show is not about me today because I know we had a couple shows about me. That's how we do the QA. It's cool. We'll have another one of those shows after I collect all the messages from you guys and the questions. It's all cool. But today's show is a very special show because it's unique. This is one of the sports that. Uh, let me tell you, this is one of the sports that a lot of people grow up never actually partaking in. Maybe because one thing, it wasn't available to you guys. But guess what? No, it's available to you guys on all three islands. So we're talking about St. Croix, St. Thomas, and St. John's. It's available. And today's show going to let you guys know exactly what's going on. So guess what? We got a vice president today on the show, Mr. Bruce Arno. Mr. Bruce, well, Mr. Arno. Hey man, how's it going, man? I am great, and how's yourself? I'm going well, except I've got some sore muscles after being in archery camp for about a week with the U.S. national coach and very on turns and I was the national coach, so oh, I'm sore. Oh, you see it there, people? My boy, Miss. Hey, Vice President Anna said he sore from being in archery at. So you, so wait, you was at a national training center, uh, with the U.S. team, right? Yeah, so that's right. Actually, it was uh, the Joy Lee training camp. It was up in the mountains near San Bernardino, California. Okay. And there was a there was a lot of archers from the U.S. there, but also Spain's entire team there, and Bolivia's entire team was there. Okay. And parts of the Mexican team were there. So over forty people, about forty five. Uh, it was a pretty full week. All right. So so wait. All right. So we in San Bernardino, California, right? And this is, right. so, so you was at a training center, so y'all went up there, you got three different, four different countries there, and everything is all about archery. That's right, it was just a week of archery, basically you had to get up at 5.45 every morning, you didn't get back until about 11 p.m. 5.40, and that's Pacific time, that's, that's, so from us, that's about five hours, four, five hours away, in time-wise, so what time zone are you in now? Okay. stopping off along the way to change out my equipment mm -hmm. and because uh, I didn't take my competition equipment with me you really beat up your arrows you really beat up your equipment during a camp so I didn't want to take my competition rig and my competition arrows so I'm having to swap those out here okay so and, uh, I'll be on the islands on the fourth okay so you got okay okay cool so here what let me ask you a question all right all right so wait sure. you said competition equipment so now you got your training gear competition no, you got your competition and then you got your clinic slash training gear. So what's the difference between your training slash clinic gear comparing to what it is um, for the championship for competition gear? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so my competition gear is designed to handle Olympic distances, which is 70 meters. It's about 77 yards. So the arrows are lighter, they're thinner. My limbs are a little bit heavier. In other words, the draw weight that I pull back, so it puts more speed into the arrows. Uh, when I'm training, 
training, I don't like to use those. They're, they're extremely expensive. Uh, they're, they run about $45 a piece all together. So when I'm training, I like to use cheaper, heavier, thicker arrows so that they can take more damage. I don't have to get them to go as far as it's fast. Um, also, generally, when I'm using a training bow, I have two sets. I have one that's lighter than I normally pull in competition, mm -hmm. about four pounds, and I have ones that are heavier by about a pound and a half. So I rarely train I train with my competition bow. Some people do. They like to train with their competition bow and just use it all the time, whereas I don't. I like to do lighter ones, sometimes heavier ones. But either way, the arrows are cheaper, so I don't, if I beat them up, I'm not as sad about it. Okay, so now I'm about to get very technical in this because, so if you don't know, I used to run track and field, right? And um, I had I had competition gear and I had training gear. So now right. when you tell me what, because the arrow is cheaper, ideally, because you could bang them up, does that change the actual competition phase when you're using the expensive brand? or the expensive arrows, like, is there a major difference in a sense of off by two millimeters to three inches when you actually shoot from 70 meters away? Yeah, if I were to shoot my training arrows at 70 meters, I have to aim uh, probably about a good three and a half feet higher on the target because they take a longer time to get there, a lot more arc on the arrow, so it goes higher in the air and has to come down, whereas my competition arrows are much faster. Um, so yeah, I can aim about three and a half feet lower and they'll still hit the center. On a good day, they'll actually group the same. On a good day, I'll shoot the same score with both, but when it gets windy, you don't want your arrow when the air is long. You want your arrow to get there as quickly as, as possible. possible. Uh, so wait, all right, because I'm trying to, because I, I remember when, um, when, um, when Nick came down during the spring, I think it's spring break, we was training the dock up there in Red Hook. Uh, we, we created, we, yeah, we created... <laughs> A 70 meter um, uh, shooting range to where we could shoot from that distance from the dock to the land and it worked out perfect so here's the thing now so now as we're training because you know when you train you practice to be perfect so now because you're not using the same arrow now I'm thinking because now you have to aim higher but but so like okay so I'm trying to figure out like if you use the most if you use the expensive one because that's the one you're going to use during competition, why not practice what you preach? Because now you don't have to alter aiming three and a half feet higher or less. You're using exactly what you'll be using during competition in quote-unquote Rio. Uh, not Rio, sorry, in um, Tokyo 2020. Yeah, that's a good question. And the reason that I use training arrows is because of the expense. When you start to get up to a pretty decent level in archery, you start, even at 70 meters, your group starts shrinking pretty dramatically. Mm -hmm. Particularly if you practice as much as we are right now. And um, also, on my competition arrows, because I think they group better, I actually use very weak knocks. In other words, the thing on the back of the arrow that connects it to the string. On my competition arrows, they don't offer very much protection. Mm -hmm. The trade-off is I believe they group better, which is what I want. I only care about my score. Right, right, I right. Those arrows and training. Yeah. If I were to use those arrows in training, they get beat up really bad. And what happens is with those competition arrows, you get what's called a Robin Hood, which is just like it sounds. You actually punch one arrow through the shaft of the second arrow. Uh -huh. And you can, you know, there's there's a good $45 down the drain. And there have been days where I've Robin Hooded two or three. And like, oh, this has got to stop, or I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be able to do this sport anymore. Yeah, I see. You can shoot yourself out to arrows. Right, that's right. It's, it's really the only thing that's a continual cost for archery. Once you buy the equipment, I know people who use equipment that's 20, 30 years old. They don't say they like it, they like the way it feels. But arrows, competition arrows are good for about one year. They start getting kind of worn. Um, and you just don't want to use it a whole lot because it just puts wear on them. It starts changing the characteristics of the arrow. So you know, I like to use uh, training arrows that have heavier back end, and that way if they hit it, it doesn't really damage the arrow all that much. And even if it does, I'm not as concerned about it. <laughs> all right, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. All right, because nah, cause I was going to say, like, when I'm out there, quote unquote, running around, well I, well, I was a jumper, so I did long jump, triple jump, and high jump. Uh, only thing I didn't uh -huh. attempt was the pole vault. But when I had my, 
training gear, um, practice gear, you know, it, it, it wasn't as nice as what we had in competition gear. And usually when you yeah. have your competition gear, you don't, hey, I mean, I will have my competition spikes as well, but you know, you don't want to run out the spikes and you don't want to scuff your shoe and you don't want to get it as sandy. I jumped in sand for a living, but the chance that you don't, you just don't want enough sand that's in there. So I try to prolong the amount of sand that was in there. Um, and the difference was, I guess it was the, unless it was the same shoe, unless I had a brand new shoe, that it was pretty much um, the comfort level on the type of shoe that I had at the time comparing to my um, competition one. So, sound good to me. All right, so, all right, so, as we know, you're still training now. So here's the thing. So my question now is like, so your VP, how does a VP and a current athlete, how do you do a good job of balancing? Because now I get into balances, many of the athletes that are on all our national team are in university. So how do they balance training and quote unquote education so student first student athlete so they got the schoolwork and they got training how are you able to balance that between being president and being um and being an athlete and then your regular life because you know you're not, you're an adult so many of the younger adults don't have that amount of challenges that's right well i have a full-time job also i'm a, a professor um so i have to do that as well but being a professor is kind of nice and I get to manage my schedule so I teach out in the morning and then I, I can come home on those days and just shoot um, so that's pretty nice uh, that work and as far as my obligations to the Virgin Islands Archery Federation there's two of us who work quite a bit in this area so the first is President Kevin DeMore um, he handles most of the finances most of the negotiations uh, he's the one who goes to the world meetings he's really kind of taking a lot of that over so that I don't have to do those things. Mm -hmm. um, I mainly at times handle communications, press releases. Really my, my job load is, is quite halved thanks to the amount of work that he does. So it all works in there. I still like to get in about 100 hours more per day than I get in now, but that, it's not too bad. So I remember when I was a coach, um, coach, 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 uh, 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 what's the coach's name? Um, Angelo. So, Angelo Reeves, yes. Yes. Right. So when we was with Coach, I remember him telling me, well, I was like, so how many arrows does it take to be, you know, a great archer? And it, maybe, I, I, maybe I can't remember, but I remember the number being 500 a day. And that's a lot of arrows. And I was like, how the heck are you going to shoot X amount of arrows a day? Because that's a lot of time. But I think I could be wrong. But in, so now you can correct me. How many arrows should an a, a archer shoot per day or weekly to be able to have that type of practice that you need for when you are in competition? Yeah, that's a great question. People ask that quite a bit because they want to understand the time constraint. If you want to be a regionally capable archer, someone who's able to go to, say, a state tournament, a podium, really you can get away with something about an average of about 100 arrows a day. You can spread that out over three days a week, something like that. So it actually doesn't take a ton of commitment to get competent at this sport. Uh, you want to get to the Olympic level, generally the minimum is going to be about 250 arrows a day. And that's pushing it a little bit. But some archers actually like to practice fewer. They, they really want to practice just quality time. That's about what I get per day, about five to six days a week. Um, so that's a typical practice spell for me. If I do 200 one day, I'll bump it up to 300 the next, something like that. Uh, my teammate, Nicholas DeBoer, he's at college. Uh, he shoots around 300 to 400 arrows a day, five to six days a week. He practices more than I do. He's a little bit more time than I do. Um, and 500 is a bit of a theoretical maximum. And if you were a professional archer, like the Koreans have, or like we have here resident athletes, you can just practice from morning to night and they don't have to worry about getting fed. We can do around 500, uh, but generally around 400 is what I've seen most archers do who are trying to make it to the Olympics. There's a time when you can start to do too much. Okay, because now the next thing that I came from asking about is that not that you're tired physically and running up and down, but now that you're tired from focusing your eyeball 
on a target all day. So how much wear and tear do you get from focusing all day? Literally focusing after three to 400 arrows. So this is kind of the interesting aspect of archery. Believe it or not, you don't aim very hard. I've got about less than 20% of my energy into aiming. Um, as long as generally the pin is somewhere near where I want to shoot the arrow, I'm fine with it. It can drift around, it can rock around, it can do circles on the target. As long as it stays fairly close to where I'm aiming, that's good enough for me. And you may think, well, it's kind of crazy, right? Because you're trying to hit essentially what is about a 10 centimeter diameter uh, circle. But believe it or not, your body and your brain actually make up for it. You don't have to aim very hard. I put most of my energy into feeling what my body's doing, how it's bringing the arrow through, you know, how I'm pulling back. That's actually more important. It's more important to pace yourself so that you're not stopping and starting when you're pulling on the arrow. You want a nice, smooth pull. And then we have a device that tells us when it's time to release. When that device goes off, uh, you want to make sure that that release is as near perfect as you can get. So... If you put too much effort into aiming, believe it or not, you usually end up feeling worse in terms of your score. Also, no, now you now you answer the question of why I wasn't aiming as good when we was in Red Hook the um in spring, cause I'm over here, I over here focusing right, and um, right. I'm you know I mean this is my first time doing it, so, which is I mentioned at the beginning of the show. Um, a lot of athletes never really been uh were introduced or, or aware of archery. They might see it on TV, but they don't know how to get into it. But we'll talk about it in the next segment. Sure. But so the first day I got into it, um, I was there and I was okay. So make sure I've, I'm targeting here. The the, the 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 cross shows the bullseye, and I'm there and I'm like, man, like my body is like, okay, if I stop breathing, then I could hold still. But if, you know, your heartbeat is going. So um, I'm over there just like, I can't stop. My hand is moving. I, was, I didn't realize how much your body moves when you don't want it to move. And oh, then, absolutely right. yeah, so that's why I, I, I started out at 10 meters away. I think it was about 10 meters. Uh, I had like five hours. Actually. 10 meters, yeah. right? Yeah, and, 10 and, meters is a good distance to start at. Yeah, even, even I remember when they started me at two meters away, but still, the fact is, I just remember the build up to it and how much I was not frustrated, but I wasn't really using I don't have to focus that much. And playing other sports, um, but yeah. this one made me focus a lot, and I was like, "But you remember?" Because I was really looking into it, and I was like, "Okay, well, I gotta hit this bullseye. It's wind out here, um, and then the release. Um, if you don't release, depending on how hard you snatch it, and then if you move, and I was like, "Oh, this is really technical. Like it get it get really down into it." If the release is about 85% of your accuracy, so if you do anything to mess up your release, you're in a lot of trouble really fast. So that's why if you put too much effort into aiming, you're not going to have a clean release. The arrow is just going to go all, I mean, you can actually tell when the arrow is coming out of your fingers what's going on with it. Um, so really, that's the kind of thing you need to put energy on, not aiming. Aiming is really pretty secondary. It's, the best way I can put it is, there are some sports that are aim sports, and there are some sports that are form sports. And archery is actually a form sport. You actually oh. don't aim very much. So, see, I think that's cool because even in track and field, because, you know, I, well, I'm a, I only could speak directly for track and because we did this on a professional um, le, le, um, on a level, right? The other sports I understand too, but I'm a, going for track and field. Form is important, and it's important for when you teach somebody at the beginning the fundamentals of it because later on everything you taught that person you teach them how to break it yep you know right. so you know you understand when, when those listeners who have done sports to a high level they understand that the way you control your body is, is much more important than the way you control external factors and, and aiming is kind of external to what we do um Back in the day, we used to shoot 90 meters. That used to be the long distance. It's rarely done anymore, but that's what really what separated that distance. That's 100 yards away. Heck and you yeah. can tell people who were aiming, they'd start trembling, they'd start moving all over the place. The people who did the best were people who looked like they weren't putting much effort into it at all. And those are the people who gripped past 100 yards. 
And and what's funny that you just said that is is when you practice so much and done something so so much. It's effortless, so it's like ah, oh, I did this in my sleep. Like it's, it's it's like I'm not even trying to do this, and then that's when you know, you got it. That's right. So Strange. you know what? Archery is. Go ahead. Know, go ahead. Mm-hmm. It's it's an instant feedback sport. Like I said, as soon as you release, you actually if you, once you start to get really good at archery, you can feel what the bow and arrow are doing, and you can go, "This is going to be great," or "This is going to be horrible." Uh, if you look at Brady Allison's bronze medal winning effort in the Rio Olympics in 2016, after he releases his final arrow, which is going to determine the bronze medal, he doesn't even bother to follow through. He releases and he knows immediately it's going to go into the gold ring. So he just automatically starts celebrating even before the arrow is tracked all the way to the target because <laughs> you can feel it. See, there it is. So y'all hear that, folks out there? Sometimes it's all about when you're feeling it. So I guess so. We'll come right back. VP Mr. Arnold, right in the building with VIOC in action, right back in the flash. <laughs> hey, welcome back to VIOC in action. We're here talking about archery and all what the archers do. Um, today's show is very unique because now we get to get inside of literally how the archers do it. And I, you know, I got a veteran archer on here, so it's, it's, it's cool when we get to dissect the sport down to where others out there like myself from 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 the civilian world, from the community, get to listen in and see how this sport is done, you know, to be a part of like, oh, I didn't actually realize how much effort and energy that goes into each and every different sport. Um, and actually, like I mentioned, you guys, like, hey, I was focusing all in, and, you know, and that was one thing, but clearly I was doing, using too much of that energy, and when I could have just relax and free flow and do what I got to do. So as you guys know over there, that's why we're listening to the show. Because we actually only have the insider's view of how the things them don't understand. You understand? Say, so, hey, Mr. Arnold, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks a bunch. Yeah, no, this is great. I'm glad I'm having a chance to talk to people in the islands about archery. No, nah, yeah, you know what I mean? Because you're going to you gonna got to talk to them just no soon, so I want them to know. So we're kind of easing everything in, right? So when they come in, they can be like, hey. Because, you know, they're going to, hey, one thing about us, right? The voice, they're going to ask you questions. They're going to see what you want to know. And they're going to see if you know your stuff. You know what I mean? Cause that's, and, and, I, and I think that that's cool because hey, you're a guy. And sometimes if you don't, you play. Hey, y'all come out. As a matter of fact, you guys have an event that's coming up this weekend. Um, uh, you, you can tell me more about that event where people will come out and, and, and let's have some Q&As. So tell me about your event coming up this weekend. Yeah, that's right. So uh, we actually have two. Uh, first on St. Croix on the 7th, so that's a Saturday. Right, we right, today. the National mm-hmm. Championships. Okay. And we'll be there. Uh, it's free to come watch. Uh, there is a archery range just right around the corner from the old uh, rum factory there. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as that's over, and that's the target archery tournament, there is a 3D tournament on that day, but we don't shoot 3D in the Olympics. I don't hunt, so I'm not too worried about that. And then the next day on St. Thomas, we have got a event that I am just extremely excited about because finally um, the Virgin Islands Archery Federation, in collaboration with the Virgin Islands Department of um, uh, excuse me, the DPNR, their Parks and uh, yes. Natural Resources, mm-hmm. uh, we're going to open an archery range on St. Thomas. First purpose-built field of archery. Uh, it's at the northeast corner of the Bertha C. Um, Boshillet Middle School property. And we okay. work with the principal there and the teachers there, and they've been great because their students want to learn archery. So we're excited. We're going to open the field on Sunday the 8th. Mm-hmm. And starting at 3.30 p.m., we're going to have an open house where people can come out, try archery. If they haven't, we have bows that they can borrow. If you have your own bow, that's great. You can bring that, too, and you can shoot that. We're going to have four targets set up, probably two at 10 meters, one at 15 meters, and then a demonstration target at 70 meters so people can see what the Olympic distance looks like. And uh, if I have time, I'm going to... In between answering questions and talking to people, maybe I'll shoot that distance for some people and they can see what it looks like. All right. No. All right. So let me get it straight. So look, December 7th, which is today, we got St. Croix over there. Big up St. Croix within the national championship. And then tomorrow, December 8th, um, at 3.30 at BCB, for those over here in St. Thomas, 
BCB, uh, which I, uh, Bovoni area. Um, this is where, we, it's the, our opening night for our quote unquote St. Thomas um, National Field. And this will be our shooting range. And um, we get to see pretty much the different, well, f- this is what we get to learn. This is our first introduction to the quote unquote national team of how we learn the sport. Am I right or wrong? Right. Okay, so for people on St. Thomas. So this is this is you only want kids of all ages, or we got adults in there too. Like how how was how was this clinic going on? How, how is it going to be presented? Yes. So there's two aspects to how, what we're going to be doing. First is just getting people involved in archery, showing them what archery looks like. Really, all ages can do it, but we do ask that the children be a minimum of eight years old. People look at archery, they think it's great, it's a neat sport, and it really is, but it's still a weapon that we're handling. So we'd like to make sure that children are at least eight years old before they come out um, to see what archery is about. They so, want to come out and look and maybe plan for the future, they're a little younger, but generally want to start children around eight years old um, actually shooting. Okay, so now we got eight years, at least minimum-wise, to get the concept of, of the sport. Um we got eight years old and up because now, so let me ask you this now. So in archery, so uh, let's talk, so in, in track and field, we have a master's group. We have a seniors group, which is 18 and up. Then we have the youths group, which I think it's 15 and to 18 or 15 to, yeah, 15 to 18. And then 